Dorsa Amir, it's so great to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for the invite. So you wrote an article for us recently responding to a viral Twitter thread about hunter gatherers and human health. And you thought it was one of the most and nuanced takes on you've ever seen, correct? Yeah, it was pretty bad, to be honest. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what you saw and um, what was your reaction to it? Yeah, absolutely. So as someone who's trained in anthropology, um, you often encounter a lot of myths and, and tropes and stereotypes of the media about hunter-gatherers. It's a place where our imagination often goes. Um, the problem is when those myths and stereotypes and tropes enter into mainstream discussions and end up potentially harming the populations that you're talking about. And I think that's what was happening here. And so the, the history of this is that um, Dr. Anthony Gustin, who is a chiropractor turned uh, health coach, I believe, um, went on a one week trip to the Hadza, who are a forager group in Tanzania. So they're still largely hunting and gathering um, for a lot of their food. And he went there on essentially a one week vacation hunting trip to learn how they live and, and maybe garner some insights into how we should be living. The problem was when he came back, he, he sent us this narrative through Twitter about what the experience was like and what he learned from it. And in doing so, the, the characterizations of the Hadza and the things that he was saying um, were actually rather harmful. Uh, so he described the Hadza uh, in terms that are often used to describe non-human animals using terms like endangered species, wild humans, natural habitat, uh, and terms that you usually don't use to talk about fellow human beings. Uh, and what I wanted to really address in uh, the article that I wrote for his novelist was how this type of language and this framing of hunter-gatherers as kind of an exotic curio um, that we can stu study and learn something about um, is really damaging actually to their livelihoods and their uh, uh, place within the larger world. Uh, and it's the kind of language that governments usually use when they want to uh, uh, attack the sovereignty of a lot of these people. And so I really wanted to try and set the record straight, not on just the factual inaccuracies uh, of what he described, which we can get into a bit later, but also the way in which he talked about uh, the Hadza. Yeah, so you describe his characterization as reawakening the dark history of anthropology. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so, you know, like many scientific disciplines, um, there is a, a dark history in the past of science or essentially pseudoscience being used to understand human diversity, um, often with nefarious intent. And so anthropology, I think, is, is one of the... Um, worst disciplines when it comes to its history. So the history of anthropology is fraught with pseudoscientific attempts to characterize essentially non-white people um, as inferior or a subspecies to um, white people. And the language and the ways in which people describe this variation um, has kind of carried through into some of the ways in which we describe indigenous populations today. And so again, using terms like wild humans that are an endangered species. Those are terms that invoke this very dark history um, that I think really needs to be reckoned with in public discourse. Mm -hmm. And in, in the piece you write, it is tempting to think our bodies are in a state of evolutionary mismatch, such that the cultural and energetic environment has changed too rapidly for our gene up. There is some truth to that, you say, but as with all things anthropological, there is nuance to consider. What is the truth in that idea of evolutionary mismatch? Yeah, so this is kind of a, a concept from within anthropology and evolutionary biology that has made it into the mainstream. But in doing so, like a lot of things do when science is kind of brought out of the scientific discipline into public discourse is a lot of the nuance and complexity gets lost. So as you just defined, evolutionary mismatch is the idea that the cultural or uh, energetic environment has changed too quickly for genes to keep up. 
And in fact, what I mentioned is that there is some truth to that, right? So human cultural evolution has been rapidly progressing, uh, almost exponentially. So for 99% of humanity's time on this planet, we lived in smaller bands of foragers who are mobile. Uh, approximately 10,000 years ago, in some regions, you start getting the rise of agriculture. And then we go from that to what we are living in today in this just kind of like industrialized, massively large population size, interconnected global world. Um, and that is a really rapid change. So all of that is happening within the last like 1% of human evolution. And there is something to be said about um, our bodies and minds potentially not being able to biologically evolve in response to those uh, pressures. So the biological evolution is much slower than cultural evolution. And there is some truth to that in that the energetic environment that we're living in now is very different than the energetic environment that we faced throughout our history. So one of the things that we have access to that we really didn't have much access to in the past is an unbelievable surplus of calories, of energy, of sugar, of carbohydrates. Um, and all of this energetic input is shaping the way that our bodies develop across the lifespan. And in some cases, like in the case of um, type 2 diabetes, we're actually kind of reaching the natural limits of the amount of glucose, for instance, that our body can process. And we have to um, use insulin to, to kind of supplement the amount that we can make because um, we've reached the, the upper limit, essentially, of what was possible in the past. And so there is some truth to the fact that um, we have to kind of consider that our genes might not be fully uh, uh, responsive or not optimized for the world that we live in now. But a very shallow understanding of this, and this is what I mentioned in the piece, is that there is this misunderstanding of what this means. It's not the case that in the Paleolithic, we lived in this state of perfect health and harmony with nature, and really all we need to do is go back to that because that was the Garden of Eden, right? There were a lot of things that have been uh, uh, ameliorated as a result of this process. Lots of things are better now. Um, we have sanitation, we have medicine, we have hygiene, we have so many things that are better now than they were before. But there's this really like common myth that we just need to like go back uh, and everything that we're doing now is like unhealthy and we just need to like go back to being hunter gatherers and everything will be perfect again. Uh, and I think that's just that's a misunderstanding of, of the process itself. Right. And Dr. Gustin in his thread tried to point and also sells um, kind of his own customized snacks that are supposed to be geared to this other picture of human health based on an understanding of this evolutionary mismatch to get us to get away from the sort of modern food that we use today and are making us unhealthy in his eyes. Um, th does that make sense? That's right, yeah, there's actually an entire, it's a huge industry actually built up around this idea that we need to just go back to a forager lifestyle. Um, popularly, there's something called a paleo diet. Um, paleo is actually like a up and coming trend in, in the diet sphere. You can go to your local grocery store probably and find paleo specific um, items. Um, there's also what, this is Dr. Gustin's friend, Paul Saladino, um, what, he call, what he calls the carnivore diet that actually like humans are optimized for meat and we should be ingesting a lot of meat. Um, so I think there is an entire yeah, economy around selling this idea to people and telling them that like this is the thing that will cure all the ails that you have now, all of the stress, the obesity, the mental health challenges, a lot of that can be linked back to your diet and it's because our diet is mismatched and we have to kind of go back. Uh, so again, this is I think a very shallow understanding of the process of human evolution um, and I think it's, yeah, there's just so much money to be made, I suppose, that people are willing to kind of push this narrative to sell their supplements or whatever. Um, and I feel like there's not enough uh, introspection and reflection going on to really think about what that says and how that shapes people's understanding of human evolution and human diversity. Right. And in the piece, you make the point that because of humanity's cultural evolution in so many different ecosystems, we've so many different kinds of cuisines that rely on different sorts of food and there's so many different ways you can be healthy and obviously there's a lot of different ways you can be unhealthy too but so how is it that we've developed to 
thrive on so many different foods while maintaining a, a, a decent level of human health. Yeah, so this is like, I think, the secret sauce to what makes humanity so successful. With humans, truly variation is the norm. So compared to other primate species, other mammals, we display an incredible amount of flexibility and plasticity. So consider the fact that our primate cousins, like chimpanzees or bonobos, they live in like one region of Central Africa. That's pretty much it. Now think about the human map, right? We live in every single ecology on the planet. We live in the Arctic, we live in the Amazon, we live in the Sahara, and we are able to, through our behavioral and cultural adaptations, develop bodies of knowledge about how to survive within each of these ecologies. This is really like unprecedented in the animal kingdom, and I think something that isn't appreciated enough about what makes humanity so unique. Um, when other animals, go out and live in these different spaces, they do so by becoming different species and specializing to that ecology. We do this by still remaining the same species, right? We have these incredible adaptations that allow us to do this. And through generations and generations of individual experience and cultural knowledge, we're able to figure out what things in that environment can sustain us. And there's this process of refinement going on in each of these cultures. And so this is why you have thousands of different cuisines around the world, all of which are able to meet the nutritional requirements for keeping a human body up and running. Um, it's almost always some combination of meat and animals, uh, I'm sorry, meat and uh, plants, but not always, right? So you have entire massive countries like India where vegetarianism is a really um, a, a common dietary strategy uh, and you're still able to meet a lot of those dietary requirements. And so as with all things human, including uh, diet, variation is the norm. And so when I hear people say you should follow a paleo diet and follow what humans were doing in the paleolithic, my response is, which humans of the paleolithic, right? At some point we were living, I mean, and we still are, in every ecology. We're living, we're subsisting on marine meat, we're subsisting on baboons, right, which is what the Hadza, uh, as Anthony Gusson kind of pointed out, are eating. Um, we're subsisting on fish, on plants, on tubers, on everything. Um, we are truly incredibly omnivorous. And so the idea that there is like a magic recipe and a, a clear diet that's correct to follow is just simply incorrect when it comes to understanding humanity. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about what your focus is now in your evolutionary anthropological work. What are, you, what are you up to recently? Yeah, so I'm really fascinated by human behavior, which as I mentioned before, is really one of the ways in which we are able to accommodate all these vastly different parts of the world, all the different challenges that they pose. So a lot of the work I do is focused on behavior and how different environments actually help promote the development of different behaviors. So I focus mostly on kids, on the kind of origins of this behavioral flexibility and how children really understand the social world around them and integrate that information into their own behavior. So I do a lot of cross-cultural work with other populations, uh, in particular among the Chuar of Eastern Ecuador, who I've been working with since 2013. Um, they are a forager horticulturalist group that lives in Amazonian Ecuador and who is still largely in, in many regions um, hunting, gathering, and planting crops in their garden for their subsistence. And so in going out and really sampling human diversity, what we can try and understand is what features of our behaviors are more shared and more consistent, and what features seem to be a lot more penetrable by cultural and environmental input. And so that's really the, the core of what I research is what are the types of things that are uh, behaviorally flexible um, as a result of different cultural and ecological environments, and what are the things that, that tend to be more consistent. What are, the, what are some of the biggest or most surprising differences you see in the way the groups you've studied raise children compared to how we do it over here? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is uh, the thing that I was most struck by actually when I first started doing um, field work among these Shuar communities. Uh, I actually went in with an interest in medical anthropology. I was really interested in physical and physiological differences. Um, but the first summer I went down there, I was just so struck 
by how different the kids were and how different their lives were from um, the American kids, you know, that I, I interact with and I was one myself. Um, I think the the way in which um, children there practice their autonomy is very, very different. I think that's really the core difference that I see. So kids there for a lot of their time, um, so they are in school um, during the school year, but the short the days are a little bit shorter and outside of school, they have like a, a tremendous amount of autonomy over their own lives. So they decide what they wanna do, they go explore with their friends, they go foraging for themselves, they cook food for themselves over the fire. There's just a tremendous amount of independence that I don't really see quite as much here in the United States. Uh, and the other thing that really struck me was the amount of time that children spend in groups with other children. So this, these aren't just like lone children running out and doing this by themselves. All of this is almost entirely done within the context of mixed sex and mixed age playgroups. And so there are just these like this incredible secondary community of children um, that is that is a huge part of what it means to be, um, you know, a community member. It's a big part of short culture. And in fact, in a lot of these small scale societies, um, they have relatively high fertility rates. And so you have a lot of kids um, among the Schwar, almost half the population is under the age of 15. So there's a lot of kids and they're really, I think, contributing in important ways to Schwar culture. Um, they generate their own cultural inventions, um, new ways of speaking, new ways of being. They have their own culture. Uh, and I think this type of, you know, innovation and flexibility and independence is really not something that we see as much of in places like the United States, where we have kind of restricted and restricted and restricted the amount of time and space that children have to set their own agendas um, by kind of filling their schedule with things ourselves, with school, with um, extracurricular activities, things like that. Um, and in general, I think there's a tendency to treat children more like large babies than small adults. Uh, you know, there, there tends to be this more like hierarchical, we tell them what to do, when to do it, and we let them know what their allowances are. Um, and that's not necessarily the same um, experience, I think, that someone might have uh, in a Shore community. Yeah, I, if I'm correct, I think it's actually outlawed in some states to allow your child to have the autonomy to maybe walk to the grocery store and pick up some food. You could get in trouble if someone reports you for letting your child be alone like that. Yeah, so this is something that's increasingly happening and actually really has been happening within the last generation or so inside uh, the United States and other countries like it is this, I think, massive um, uh, movement toward making, you know, child autonomy something that's feared. Uh, so yes, there are a lot of laws, for instance, about leaving children on their own, letting them go out and run errands. They basically need to be accompanied by an adult at all points. Um, and there are lots of stories of um, people getting into legal trouble, for instance, for letting their like seven-year-old go to the grocery store by themselves. So that's something that's, I think, um, unfortunately happening more and more in a lot of the states. What do you imagine might be the psychological or developmental consequences of fleeing children's autonomy in this way for so long level adulthood? I think this is this is a really important question. So um, it's hard to know. It's hard to know exactly what the effects are. And I think there are lots of longitudinal studies right now trying to figure out what the long-term consequences of this might be. There are some hypotheses, for instance, um, about rising uh, rates of anxiety or what we're diagnosing as attentional disorders, for instance. Um, and um, as I experienced this myself, um, typically in, in development, there is this ratcheting up of independence, right? So you kind of start out practicing autonomy in different ways, you build on that, you assume responsibility within the household, you're doing consequential things for the family, uh, and then at some point you graduate more or less to being an adult, maybe um, leaving the house. Now, it seems that in a lot of the households in the United States, that ratcheting effect is kind of going away and we're not really giving kids an opportunity to gradually refine and build upon these skills that are really important later on as adults. And so what you have instead is this period of attenuated independence where kids are very, very dependent on um, the adults around them 
for just setting their agenda, knowing what to do, the allowances, what they can and can't do. And then you have this distinct period, usually at the beginning of college, where kids just move out and are now pretty much fully independent. And I really think that transition is, is really, really challenging for a lot of people, including myself, um, because there was no ratcheting up. There was no gradual increase. There was just this like stepwise shift into a different way of life. And I do think that a lot of uh, young adults struggle in that process um, of not really, yeah, just not being able to practice those skills and suddenly being confronted with being able or it being required to have those skills. So I think there is something about um, stress, anxiety, potentially during this period that might be a result of some of the um, practices earlier on. Mm. Well, Dorsa, that's all so fascinating. And I'm glad I got to hear a little bit about your work and how you brought this piece together on the Hadza. Um, really appreciate your time today. Of course. Thank you so much.